Welcome to our Danos Pathways to Success video series. Uh, this series of interviews have been crafted to help you learn how to approach your career. Um, I'm Valerie Phillips. I head uh, legal recruitment for our U.S. offices. With me is a friend and classmate, Michael Pastor. Hello. Hi. Um, Mike, in addition to being an old friend, is the director of the James Tricarico Jr. Institute for the Business of Law and In-House Counsel at New York Law School. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at New York Law School. And uh, briefly, I'm going to recite a little bit of the background of his career to contextualize the conversation we'll have today. Uh, prior to heading into academia at New York Law School, Mike served as the general counsel of DUIT, the New York City Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Uh, he also served as a general counsel for New York City's Cyber Command and deputy commissioner of legal affairs and franchises for DUIT as well. Prior to that, he spent uh, roughly a decade at uh, the New York City Law Department um, as senior counsel for two different uh, Two different divisions. divisions. Thank you. It's been <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, and prior to that, Mike was in private practice as a litigation associate uh, at Morrison and Forster. At the very beginning of his career, at following law school graduation, he served as a uh, federal uh, district court clerk, and uh, so he's really worn quite a few different hats: uh, public sector, private practice. Uh, then uh, various agency roles and now academia. And I think a lot of that will inform how he shares details with us about uh, career tra uh, transitions and progressions. So I think my first question to you, Mike, today, um, rather than talking at the screen, is talking to you. I'd love to hear you talk about your, your own pathway and the degree to which you feel that you were the architect of your own fate professionally and the degree to which you really feel that you bent to market forces in play that you couldn't have, couldn't have anticipated. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me, Valerie. It's great to be here uh, with someone I've known for many, many decades um, and friends with many decades and excited to be you know, talking to you and to, to, to the listeners. Um, to take your first question, I think what I would say is uh, my path has been a mix of you know me being the architect of it. Um, but then also just having been the beneficiary of great fortune. And so for me, it's been a combination of my own efforts and fortune, um, less so market market power. And I think the reason, or market forces, I should say. Fair enough. Um, and I think the reason for that is I, after working at Morrison Enforcer for some time um, in you know big firm life, um, I decided to go into government work, which I I, you know, I, I recommend to all. Um, Government work is less about sort of market forces at play um, and more about the initiatives of the elected officials and different levels of government that you work at. Um, and so that pivot there from Morrison and Forster to, um, you know, to government work, I mean, I was the architect of that. Um, but, you know, at each step along the way, you know, you're fortunate if you have very good mentors and very good um, people, um, you know, training you and sponsoring you. The word I like to use is sponsor. Um, it's not like, you know, sponsorship um, uh, on TV. It's someone who's actually actively backing your career. And I've been the beneficiary of, of incredible sponsors going back to um, the judge that I cooked for um, in the District of Maryland. Um, Judge Williams, who just had an immense impact on my career and was a sponsor of me from, you know, from the minute I walked into Chambers. Um, and so I think, yes, I think you have to, I, I did pursue, uh, I have pursued things along the way in terms of things that I wanted to do. Um, and so for my, um, in my particular case, in your market did not play a lot. I will say, though, since you raised that topic, you know, I work at New York Law School with a number of students and a number of alums. And for them, um, for the alums that I speak to, um, you know, market forces actually often play a huge role in terms of the timing of when they graduate, in terms of the timing of when they want to move. Um, and obviously, we are having market convulsions as it relates to the pandemic. Um, and I think that will be hugely impactful for people's um, careers and for um, you know the paths that they take. Sure. Some practices of law are cyclical and episodic. Um, you know, some are very steady. And whenever you have a market disrupting event, it changes things. And so I think knowing how to be flexible is useful, but also taking the lessons of whatever you've experienced and observed, being guided by that and being nimble and agile as you pivot towards the future. So I guess my question to you, uh, my next question to you would be, given that you've had time in 
private practice and as a clerk and in government and academia, how do those various hats that you've worn inform one another as you think about the practice of law? Yeah, so I mean, all of every, I feel like every position for a lawyer or for a JD, uh, for, per, for persons working in compliance, risk management, you name it, um, whether, whether you acknowledge it or not, I mean, they all operate at the interaction in a way sure. of government and the private sector and academia um, in terms of, you know, scholars are working on all different types of issues that informs um, the way we approach issues from a legal perspective. They, they inform the way judges approach those issues from a judicial perspective. Um, and, you know, for most people, let's say in-house, for example, that's I'm working, running an institute focused on in-house now, almost every single in-house position will have touch points with regulation in one way or the other. Um, you know, what that might be, you know, regulations that are in place, that might be regulators that are sort of actively overseeing industry, um, uh, that might be, you know, attorneys or JDs who work in government affairs positions thinking about how to mold regulations. Um, so I think that I do suggest to, to people beginning their career, and I'm sure that people listening who are in the beginning or, or far along. Well, considering um, a pivot. Considering a pivot, that's right. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, what I'll say from my own experience is that trying new things, being open to trying new things, um, and, and, and gaining that experience, whatever it, it, it is, um, you know, is worth it. And to, to start with one example, you know, I started at Morrison and Forster, an incredible firm that has a huge um, uh, tech practice and a huge cyber practice right now. Um, and, you know, when I started at Morrison and Forster, you know, I was, you know, we pup, and uh, I was in litigation working on, you know, huge cases. Um, but I, I really, I didn't, I was there for, you know, two and a half, three years, really feel like it was a good thing for me at that time to experience big firm life, to work on huge cases, to get trained by some exceptional attorneys. Um, and then I knew at that time, you know, after a couple of years, you know, government was my calling and I made a switch to that. And I've always sort of thought in my, in my mind, I do want to teach as well and work with students. And that's what I'm doing now. So it's about, I, 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 I mean, I can't stress enough. It's about saying yes to opportunities that come along. Um, and uh, I do think that, you know, we are at an age now where, you know, multiple experiences will benefit you. I, I feel like it may not be the case, but I feel like traditionally decades ago, people would get in a role, they'd stay in a role. And that's perfectly fine if people want to do that now. But I think in, in the environment where now, it's good for people to kind of try, try a bunch of things. Oh, yeah. And I think the market's more receptive to that. I mean, maybe I like the sound of my own voice because I'm a recruiter, but I'll tell you that... I used to, I use the metaphor of thirty years in a gold watch. Now the watch isn't gold anymore; it's a bit bit. And and thirty years in one role is just sort of anathema to people coming out of school right now. The reality is that most of the clients and businesses that I deal with really appreciate perspectives uh, guiding you, and there's no expectation that you're going to be in one space, you know, staying in your lane the whole time. With that in mind, I'd love it if you shared, because I expect some of our listeners don't know too much about the Institute, a little bit about its focus and its goals, because to the degree it's an unknown quantity, it'd be great if you could educate folks. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. So the Chicago Institute for the Business of Law uh, and in-house counsel was founded at New York Law School just over, over a year ago, mm -hmm. um, and I became the director of the Institute um, shortly after that. Um, and the Institute has sort of two main objectives. Uh, the first is um, we are preparing a comprehensive curriculum for the students at New York Law School um, who may want to go in-house, and, and, and it's about preparing them for success in-house. So that's going to be new curriculum, it's going to be programming, it's going to be um, externship and internship support, um, and it's going to be uh, engaging with the extensive New York Law School alumni community sure. to work with them. Um, and I think, I think it's fair to say, I know for me at least, when I was in law school, that type of institute did not exist. They might be out there in other law schools and that would be great, but we really think we're filling a void there. You know, for students who think to themselves, I want to go in-house, we want to prepare them for that. And that's, that's, that's preparing them from the, from the day they get in the door of New York Law School and try back up uh, to the minute um, they graduate. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is to create a thought leadership center for the community um, writ large. So there are people out there in New York City, the Tri-State area, around the country, around the world, who work in-house um, and our thesis is that they, they, they need um, more places to go to engage with other people in that community, sure. um, to talk about um, ideas, um, to exchange best practices, um, to talk about what they're seeing in their practices, um, and, and so that, that's what we're doing. To give one example of how those things combine, last fall we hosted the first Tribeca Cybersecurity Summit 
Uh, it was a two-day event at the law school with leading practitioners in cyber, both from a lawyer um, and a technologist perspective, coming together uh, to talk with our audience about about you know what you know what they're seeing and what they're doing. Um, you can see how that fits into the two objectives of the institute: For sure. students attended and can learn about what what cybersecurity is and what it means. But we also had a number of people come, you know, from from the in-house community writ large to hear about. Um, uh, that as well. Uh, so that's what we're doing. I, I never um, want to forget to mention that the sort of third uh, objective of, of the Chicago Institute is a focus on diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, that's, that's core to our mission and it's core to what we do. So yes, we are doing those first two things for students and for the in-house community writ large, but we have our eye um, on uh, justice and equity as well. Um, and it fr- that those objectives frame our programming no, I think you need to have partners moving the needle and people leading by example. So it's, it's great to hear about that and uh, certainly aligned with what we at uh, Danos try to do. Um, briefly, you spoke about cybersecurity. I know that you mentioned it was something, it's certainly not all of what the Jacarico Institute does, but it informs uh, some of the work, and you're informed by it having worn the hat of somebody dealing with incident response and preparation. So given that it's a growing area, Something I heard recently in one of my own searches, um, I was speaking with a lot of attorney candidates trying to source for a role that was very um, security focused. And I spoke with a lot of people doing data privacy. And I feel like those two threads, they, they, they touch, but then they diverge in places. I'm curious what your observation is in the cybersecurity world about the interplay between security law on the one hand and data privacy on the other. Absolutely. So the, the, the touch points between those two fields um, are, are, are nearly uh, never ending in a way. Um, and what I would say about them is, let me start with security. So that was, I was the general counsel for the New York City Cyber Command. So we were focused on, you know, securing um, not just the data, right, that it was held, held by the city, but also the city systems and its networks to, to allow the city to function. Right? Right. So I think from that perspective, you know, cybersecurity has its eye um, on the operations of an organization. Mm-hmm. You know, can our organization continue to operate? Um, can our organization um, remain secure from threats? And so, you, and then the lawyer's role in that is sort of like, how can I assist the CISO um, and the other folks working on the technology side? How can I assist them in maintaining the cybersecurity program for the organization? So it's, it is focused a lot on the operations yep. of, of the organization. Um, privacy has a sort of different root from, in, in, in my opinion, it, it has a, a root in, in what I would call a rights-based focus, right? Which you don't hear about a lot in cybersecurity. Um, and so it's sort of focused on, you know, the protection of data from a rights perspective, from what it will mean to the individual um, if their data um, is misused, uh, stolen. Um, and that could be misused by the organization itself or by someone who steals it. Right. Um, and so I, so I think those are the sort of the differences um, but what I will say is kind of these, these are sort of two rivers that sort of flow in and out. And, and, and to that point, um, I, would, I would add that, you know, I started by saying cybersecurity is about operations. So you might draw from that, well, that doesn't have a human component. But what's, the truth of the matter is that if, if a cyber attack is successful, it can very frequently have a, a, a significant human impact. I'll give you an example. Um, a hospital system, mm-hmm. whether in COVID or not, hospital systems have cybersecurity programs, they have cybersecurity controls. Um, and with yeah. telehealth, I'm sure, all the more complicated. Tele- all the more. Yes, yeah, so there's a collection of data. Right. So thinking about kind of keeping it private and protecting it. So storage also, of data. Storage of data mm-hmm. um, and all that. But there's also sort of the human element of, um, of the cybersecurity exercise. And that's actually why I think it's such an appealing career choice for those interested. Sure. Um, you know, I, I feel like people like to go to work and, and, and do something that makes them feel fulfilled and makes them feel that that they're, you know, leaving a mark, you know, on the world. Adding value. Uh, adding value, absolutely. And so if you are a, an attorney, you know, operating in privacy, risk, compliance, cyber, um, all of those things sound kind of dry and technical, but have a real profound um, impact, or they, they, have a profound, they have a profound impact if they're not done well. And, and so that's why I think for people wondering, you know, would I pivot to cyber? Would I pivot to privacy? What would that look like? That, that might be why you want to do it. Yeah, and I know you can't speak to specific incidents, nor would I ask you to, but just generally, I assume that a lot of what we learn in terms of proactive steps we might wish to take 
isn't just a matter of reading and interpreting regulations, but responding to actual breaches. So I'm curious, you know, in terms of what you've done and speaking with other GCs and other agency heads, how do we learn and how does responding to breaches inform our approach to all things cybersecurity? Yeah, that's, I think what I would say about that, Valerie, is it, uh, let me take it from the, the viewpoint of a lawyer, since that's that's what I am and, 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 and what I was. I mean, I think what I learned as the General Counsel of New York City Cyber Command is that there are certain things um, that um, lawyers do when they're doing their job well um, that apply, I think, apply in any practice, and they certainly apply in incident prep and incident response. Sure. Um, so what does that mean? So if you're, you're preparing your incident response plan, well, lawyers, you know, will come at that and look at, you know, what does the language of that plan say? Um, who's involved? You know, what, you know, who's responsible for what? This is something that, that in-house lawyers think about all the time and, and, and do well for non-cyber things is what I'm trying to explain. Um, and then I would say that within the confines of, of incidents, potential breaches, um, and investigations that follow, um, I think that, you know, lawyers are meant to be in a steady hand. Um, they're meant to, you know, ask questions. What did we learn in law school? Like, we are asked questions and we can... Mm-hmm. Issue spot. Yes. Issue spot, ask questions, um, and, and try to find out um, the facts, get to the bottom of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that, that was, that's another, you know, key component of incident response. It's um, being steady hand, uh, asking questions, um, and, and, and learning to trade. And I think the third thing I will say, um, again, I'm, I'm not revealing anything at all about my own particular practice, but... Um, quality in-house work depends on relationship building, uh, and that is it could not be more true for cyber. Um, it means building the relationship with the CISO, with the CISO's team, um, with the other technology people, with the infrastructure people um, from day one. And right. getting to with, know, the, with the engineers, I'm sure, not just the legal and the business, but also the folks who are in the guts of the devices that track and scrape information. Absolutely. And it's just, it's about, you know, building um, that relationship, getting on first name basis. I mean, some of these things, they sound so cliche, um, but it's, it's like in that moment, you know, you want to get on the phone and be like, hi, so-and-so, we've spoken 10 times already. I've gotten to know you and I've gotten to know uh, your team and what you do. Um, you've gotten to know me and my team. So when I have other people on the call, you, you recognize them. Um, you know, all of that human relationship building is fundamental, and why is it fundamental in cyber, as it is, in, you know, for for many house things, is that cyber involves stress, sure enough. not just human stress, stress on the organization, stress on the team. Um, the relationships are uh, that the sort of fabric that would stand those stress points, and if they're not there, there's a rupture, and and you know you're not going to be where you want to be. Right. No, I think it's something that I don't remember law school speaking to enough. Not to fault my or your law school. We, I don't think we had that framework or that lens through which to look at things X number of decades ago. But, yeah. <laughs> but the reality is that it's not just um, issue spotting. It's being able to apply it. I mean, I guess if I were to analogize to physical security, um, I've seen a lot of people talking in the last week as I do scroll through Twitter about um, responding to one guy with a shoot bomb mm-hmm. once. And the problem is that sometimes you prepare for a response to a threat you've seen, but you don't know how to respond to the next threat that's coming. So if you look at it, I mean, maybe there are only some way, so many ways to breach data systems, but you have to think, what will a creative hacker do the next time? What should I be ready for that I don't know what it looks like? Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And working with people who know more about the guts of computers, know more about the guts of systems and processes than you do as a lawyer... You know, you're able to put that together and have a plan that will make it less likely that any organization or institution you're responsible for will fall prey to some sort of threat or attack. Fair? Absolutely. I mean, I think for that, for me, that comes down to the notion of being nimble as an attorney in the same way that technologists are nimble. Um, I speak with colleagues uh, frequently about this notion of sort of continuous improvement. Um, you know, what are you doing to better your practice? And I speak to the students at the Tricargo Institute. Um about this all the time, um, and because they're in, they're in law school, it's about what are they doing to improve through law school and then after. Um, and I think that that um, you know one thing that that comes to my mind there, just by way of specific example, as it relates to um, sort of thinking through uh, the prior instant, you know, prior incidents and how that might inform, are what we call in the cyber world the tabletop exercise. So the tabletop exercise is something that I um, I'm very fond of. It, it's about uh, bringing people 
literally together around a table, um, you know, remotely if it needs to be or not, you know, around the table, and you bring people around the table and you put them uh, through an exercise uh, about, you know, uh, you know, a hypothetical exercise which really um, resonates in the real world. And I think those exercises are 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 superb at identifying, you know, ways in which, um, you know, you maybe need to adjust and you need to advance, you know, for future. Um, for future attacks. I will go, go back to your question, though, Valerie, about how physical attacks, um, you know, might inform a cyber, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, practice. I mean, one of the things that I think is, is not well known is that physical security and, and cyber security are related, um, highly related. And uh, so there is that component, too, meaning, like, how are we, how, how are our data centers, how is our data Physically secure. Who has mm-hmm. physical access to the data center? Right. What about a guy or a gal with an electromagnet as opposed to somebody hacking in through a computer? Absolutely, program? that's the real thing. Although a lot of, I mean, cyber attacks don't involve physical access, but it's certainly a component of it. Um, but I do think that, that that cyber professionals, and by that I mean the technical professionals, not the lawyers, absolutely study and, and keep their eye um, on things. And I would also say that there's also, you know, there are government actors here. You know, there's CISA at the federal level and others. They are, I think, constantly looking at what what have attacks look like. And one of the things that I'm a big supporter of, I was when I was in government, I am now in academia, is sort of extensive and and, um, and solid engagement between you know the government authorities and and uh, and the public sector and the private sector to sort of all work together in tandem. Yeah. Well, one one thing I always say is the only constant is change. There's shifting regulatory terrain, and that could be at the global level, uh, dealing with information that transmits between. One constant is another, the federal, the state, and the local. And with midterms not too far um, off on the horizon, I'm curious, you know, how that informs the way you educate, the questions the students are asking, or the issues they they need to address as they mature into fully equipped private practitioners. I think what I would say about that is, you know, it's hard to say that this is the most volatile time ever. You never know what things were like in 1961 or 19 some other year. Um, but it certainly feels that way. And I think that um, when I speak to students about that, you know, that's, that comes down to, to, to preparation um, and the things that they're doing to be ready for the next generation threats and the next generation issues. Um, I will say, to go back to a point I made about what I think of as an important key to um, in-house practice is, you know, I mentioned steadiness as a concept that I think that, you know, lawyers need to demonstrate. Um, that's, you know, that's going to be true no matter what, no matter what, you know, volatility, you know, comes around the corner. I mean, I can tell you this, if you're an in-house counsel in February, in January this year, um, how many of them were thinking, well, what if there's an invasion of Ukraine, sort of how, sure. how could that impact the world and how could that impact my practice? You know, one out of a thousand, maybe zero out of a thousand, um, but that they, they've been through crises before that they know to be steady, that they know to be rigorous in their uh, legal approach, in their counsel. And one of the great things about being an in-house counsel is that there's a real classical element to it, you know, that I think goes back centuries. Um, it just in terms of, you know, whether it's a, you know, a monarch, you know, back 500 years or whoever it is, the, the notion of sort of what is my counsel, what does my counsel have to say about and how can they help me um, is something that has a real classical component. And, and I think good counseling, you know, maybe would have looked somewhat the same then, right? Sure, getting to know the client, getting to know the client's objectives. Um, Needs, um, concerns. Yeah, yeah, and knowing the regulatory landscape, whatever that would have looked like, um, you know, 500 years ago. Um, but So I think that's, that's pretty much the same. Yeah, it is interesting how that works. Uh, speaking to my own experience, I was a litigator before becoming a recruiter, and the baptism by fire that I had, because I was at the New York City, I mean, I remember having coffee with you before you joined the law department, because I had left for private practice yeah. before going into talent acquisition, and our baptism by fire was September 11th. My second day of work, the world exploded, and I could not have envisioned the fact that I would be working on declaratory judgment action for the lawsuit for family members of victims of trade center disaster to obtain death certificates where bodies hadn't been identified. Could not have prepared for that in law school. Nothing I did prepared me for that per se. The city of New York, for whom I worked at the time, was guided by two areas of law. One was um, emergency management guided by Oklahoma City because the folks in the uh, dealing with the Maris building bombing had to react. And then in addition, we had maritime law for bodies lost at sea. 
And so you may not respond to a crisis or a potential crisis or a threat that's identical in nature, but having people with institutional knowledge and a certain calm in the face of crisis really helps. So I can see how that makes a difference. Absolutely. With that in mind, I'm curious, without, again, without spilling the tea any more than you're permitted, what do you see as some of the biggest external threats that governments and businesses uh, should anticipate having to face in the coming years? So I would definitely start with um, cyber there. Um, I think that uh, that's not, that does not have to say that it's necessarily new, um, but I think that um, there is this sense that you know you need every organization, and I, I think that's true even for small ones, um, you know, needs to have a cybersecurity program uh, to uh, to deal with the threats that are out there. And I think one of the issues with the threat from cybersecurity is that the threat actors can have you know so many different profiles, you know, um, and so you, you're going to want to be want to be thinking about um, that. Um, I guess I would also say. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I would call this a threat, but I do spend a, a good deal of time, you know, thinking about the intersection of um, the proliferation of work from home uh, and, and mm. workforces um, being a part, um, for better or for worse. I'm not making a normative judgment here. Uh, uh, the devices you might use, the, uh, as I say, way that you dial into the uh, network, whatever that may be, there's a lot of different areas where there's potential slippage. Absolutely. There's a different flow of data. Uh, there are, you know, pressing questions about the use of personal devices and networks mm. for for work. <laughs> so all of which, you know, no one had the time to answer as the sort of pandemic hit us. But now it, it is what it is, and, and there's a, sort of that issue: personal devices, uh, personal uh, networks. I think there's also the question of sort of how do cybersecurity teams um, keep the necessary bonds among themselves. Um, you know, in, in a remote setting. And I just want to be clear, I'm not making a normative judgment better or worse, meaning I'm not here to talk about whether work from home is better. I, I cannot opine on that. I'm just saying that it, it's, it's, it's here to stay in one way or the other. Um, and, you know, that, that just means, and that could even be, you know, shared workspaces on top of that. I mean, as, you know, we're here. In, in we're time, sitting recording in a WeWork. <laughs> in, a, in a WeWork, and of course, it made me think of it as we started uh, today. Um, you know, shared workspaces are great. It's a way to be efficient. Um, there's a benefit from an environmental perspective, like one building, you know, different companies using it, um, but it just opens questions about, about network, about um, communications, about data flow. Uh, so, I, I, again, I'm not calling that a, a threat, per se, but I think that council um, in the cybersecurity world need to be thinking about it. And I know from the Chicago Institute's perspective and the work I'm doing with students, um, many of whom have had a large portion of their entire legal training, uh, you know, done remote. Are, are, are most of your students students who've gone straight from a uh, college setting to a law school setting without any work in between? In fact, no, it varies. But, but a lot, you know, many of our students had to be remote for a portion of sure. their law school training, and that sort of would have, you know, introduced them to that. Um, unfortunately, now, you know, we're, we're back, um, and have been for a while, back in person at yep. law school, which is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I think that's something that's, that's going to be big. And as a lawyer, you know, you're just going to be thinking, well, what does it mean uh, to practice law um, when I'm advising, you know, business teams that are operating hybrid? Sure. Now, I, I, another question that comes to mind is I hear you speaking about this, and you can keep it focused on, um, as we say, on the issues of cybersecurity that we've been discussing, or feel free to broaden out to the general practice of in-house counsel. Um, you know, just developments that you're seeing and what you anticipate in the next five to ten years and to the extent that I know you're informed by that, having worn the hats of it's like five part question. I apologize, but you've worn the hats of uh, counsel in government, uh, somebody in private practice, now as an academic. Looking at it with that, do you see more opportunities for interplay between lawyers wearing those different hats? And what do you see that sort of meaning for the practice of law, particularly for in house counsel? in the next uh, next few, next five years? I think the way I'd answer that, Valerie, is um, you know, you're going to start with technology, right? So sort of the, 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 sort of the linchpin, in my view, is technology and the ways in which technology kind of inexorably advances. Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever that looks like, you know, that is going to inform all of those touch points. Um, academia, obviously, what we do is we think about and we, we look into, um, you know, what that means. Um, from from let's say outside counsel from outside counsel's perspective, um, it's going to require 
outside firms to be prepared to handle you know technology companies as their clients, and then also to to utilize technology within the confines of their firm firm practice, um, or to deal with some clients whose technology may not be as current as one might hope. Absolutely, and to assist them in multiple ways. Um, you know, in government, you know, government, you know, never gets to sleep, right? So it's like government's job is, is always going to be there. And, you know, if there are, you know, new um, new technologies that come into play, you know, the question is going to be, you know, what what does that look like? I know I, when I was at, um, at the city, you know, we worked extensively on 5G, right, trying to make the city, um, you know, kind of a 5G mecca. Uh, we did some great work on that, and they continue to do some great work in the city on that. Um, and actually, there's an article I read today in Cravens, New York, about it. Um, that's an example where you know what does speedier connection mean from a security perspective, from a from a productivity perspective. Um, again, like we, I, I spent some time just almost in awe. Uh, you and I go back a ways in, to, to a time where, as a you know, to a pre smartphone era, um, I, I spent some time almost in awe um, of what these smartphones can do, you know, these smartphones that are sitting in our pockets. Um, and, you know, the amount of data they have, uh, the amount of, you know, the, the extensive application you know, footprint uh, that they have. The, and The computers you and I took off to our freshman year of college are just humbled by the little devices that's in there. Completely. No, no, no. And I think, so I think for me, um, that, you know, that will be, you know, something to look at, to, you know, to give one example, Bluetooth. You know, who's thinking about Bluetooth policy from a broad perspective in terms of, you know, is your Bluetooth on right now? And if it is, what's it connecting to or what's it not connecting to and who should think about it? I mean, it's a huge question for government, right? You know, back, back when I was there, um, and I'm sure people in government are thinking about that. Um, can you get hacked via Bluetooth? If so, what should you do about it? So um, those are some of the things I see coming down the pipe. Right. So everything has potential to be more blessing than curse, but you have to think about, the regulators have to figure out whether or how to regulate. The academics have to understand what it means. The folks in private practice have to guide their clients. There's just a lot to be done. And then in-house, you have to figure out whose advice to take and on what timeline. Sure. So, so much to do. With, with all this going on, um, I, I guess my real question is, you sort of stand in an interesting watershed moment where you're spearheading this amazing institute, giving advice to people who are coming up through the ranks, I guess my question is, looking at our readers, what's the top advice you would give to listeners today about career advancement in this area? <laughs> I don't, this is going to sound um, unrefined. Um, the top advice I give you know, to my students and to people who work for me is to um, be consistently a good person in all that you do. <laughs> uh, I, I think that um, you know, of all the things we've talked about, um, you know, to succeed... Uh, I still, that believes it means actually taking care of your clients, um, taking care of the teams that work for you, taking care of the people you work for, uh, and, 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 and thinking about even, even as part of that, people you don't know. Right? So, so what I mean by that is, um, you know, we all, I think, have an obligation to our fellow person. Um, and, you know, my view of it is that if you're going to work, taking care of the people you work for, obviously trying to do good substantive work, um, but I think that's, that's the true path to success. Now, do I think people who are not good succeed? Of course. <laughs> there are plenty of those. See it, yes. Plenty of those. And that's fine. It's just a different path. But, you know, you're asking me, um, and so I'm here to say to you and to the people listening, um, you know, that's my, that's my type, top advice. Um, you know, I say to my students, uh, you know, get in your uh, vocabulary, how can I help? Those words. <laughs> you know, how can I help you with this? Um, and, you know, because we're lawyers. We're supposed to help. That's kind of the point, right? No one calls a lawyer because they don't need help, right? No one has a lawyer around because they don't need help. They need help. They need, you know, I, I have this, this new regulation came out, and I don't understand it. Or I just got a contract that's 70 pages long, and it's, you know, from this, you know, opposing party. What does it say? What should it say? And you help them. So I think that, that to me, um, that's my number one, one tip. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Um, the reality is that we need to issue spot as lawyers. But the issues implicate facts, and the facts impact people's lives and livelihoods. And so if you remember that at its heart, anything you're doing is going to give people information to change their lives potentially for the better, or the operation of their businesses potentially for the better, then you're doing great. And if we sort of try to wear that hat as lawyers coming up in the industry... And if you teach people to do that, you're, you're doing wonderfully. So and I wanted to add to that, that point. Um, you know, 
we teach at New York Law School and others teach it as well. We're certainly focusing on it at, at the Tricarico Institute. Um, lawyers in-house, uh, I think, have an obligation to keep their eye on the organization doing what is right beyond what is what is lawful. Um, as I say, and I've said this recently at a, at, a, at a program we had at law school, sometimes if the lawyer doesn't do that, nobody nobody will. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that in that regard, it's not just being good, it's also just keeping your eye on you know, doing the right thing. And actually, this is something we focus on a lot at the Tricarico Institute because in classic legal training, um, that maybe wouldn't have come up. You know, you would have, you know, taken a course in contracts, you would have taken a course in constitutional law, and it would have been about the precedent and about um, how to apply the precedent and how the law evolves. Um, and so in classic legal training, it maybe wouldn't have come up, you know, are you doing the right thing? Whereas I think that, you know, in-house lawyers absolutely um, need to be thinking about that. And I would add, you know, ESG is another very important topic that that has touch points with the legal tower. Um, and that, of course, is all about doing the right thing and, and rectifying, you know, prior embedded injustice. Um, and so I think that, that lawyers have a big role and have a big opportunity. I think that uh, an organization that has a successful uh, ESG program likely will have a big supporter in the council's office um, as well um, to make it happen. Yeah, there's a difference between being told, get me to yes, and should I get to yes, and what does it mean if I get to yes? Yeah. Those mandates are very different, and if you're educating and empowering the lawyers at your institute to think about those considerations, they and the businesses they serve, and a draft would look better for it. So I think it's it's just terrific. I'm, I'm so grateful to you for sharing these perspectives uh, and being just so generous with your time. Um, you know, Thank you so much for coming today, sharing a bit about your path, and thanks everyone for listening today. So grateful to you all. Glad to do it, and if anyone reaches out to you wanting to chat more with me, I'm always available. Lovely. Thank you so much.